very, very important um, graph. Really important graph. And it's the, it's the secret to beam problems, at least right now, it's the secret to beam problems. What is the y-axis? What's the label or the value that we plot on the y-axis of this graph? Who remembers? Yep, V, M, N. It's the nominal moment, right? And what goes on our x-axis? Unbraced length, L sub B. Okay. And there's three points. Remember what they are on the x-axis? These might not be in your notes. You might have to actually remember something from the previous class. Oh, my gosh. Oh, score. L sub P. L sub R. And then we have some labels on the y-axis. What are they? Oh, M sub P and M sub R. Oh, my gosh, that's awful. There we go. I'm so bright, it just, just overpowers the screen. I'm just so bright. Anyway, so uh, M, M sub P, M sub R, L sub B, L sub R, and then we remember, I could ask you what it looks like, but that might take a while. It's flat until we hit L sub P, and then it's linear until we hit L sub R, and then what? It's nonlinear, right? It's nonlinear after that. And we call this the what? The snail chart, right? And we were so lucky. We only had one snail chart as an undergraduate. And we are now going to end up with four total snail charts. We will get there together. And that's something you need to always kind of understand. I think it helps if you understand where we're going, where we're headed, what's, what's happening, where, things like that. So, so that's, there you go. That's, that's where we're headed. Um, we're we're going to add more snail charts. But for rolled sections, you're so lucky you get to only use one. So let's talk about the definition of, oh, 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 boy, I just left out a key thing. We have three failure zones, or modes, that happen. They happen in different zones. We call them like zone one, zone two, and zone three. Okay, and those are my numbers. Those aren't universal numbers. So if you go to someone and say, oh, I'm in zone one, they don't, they don't have no idea what you're talking about. If you say something like, my L sub B is less than L sub P, then they'll know exactly what you're talking about. Okay, but for make it easy to label and understand. We have zone one, two, and three. What's the failure mode in zone one? Plastic hinge formation. Failure mode in zone two? Inelastic lateral torsional buckling. And zone three? Elastic lateral torsional buckling. What, what are the differences between those? Oh, we're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about what that really, really, really means today going to be one of the big focuses. Before that, though, we focused early on on zone one and on MCP calculations. And we're just going to say amongst ourselves, what are some definitions? What's the definition of MY? What does it mean? The yielding moment. The moment it requires for the cross-section to yield. Right? MCP. It's the moment when the plastic hinge forms. It's exactly right. What's Z? Plastic section. Plastic section modules. And Z, okay, that's a great answer. S. What's S? The elastic section modules, or just the section modules. Right? In the past, we said something like S was I over Y, and we're going to find out that that's actually not right. That was a falsehood that we were told previously. It is true if we have a constant yield in our cross section. That is true. But if we don't, we don't. Okay. Um, Z, 
Well, we often say, some people say mathematically the definition of z is, and this is still right, z, m to p is z times fy, right? However, if our fy is not constant, that this definition breaks down. Which fy do you use? The highest, the lowest? the one of the section that's yielding or failing or whatever, starts to break down. So even this definition starts to break down once we talk about materials that have different yield strengths. Okay, Different yield strengths. So when we talk about the definitions, <coughs> we realize that these are pure. MY is pure. The moment required to cause yielding. That's pure. That's always true. M sub P. The moment required to cause a plastic hinge formation. Pure. Totally pure. These are not pure. These are human derived mathematical expressions that help us simplify stuff. You know, it's kind of easy to be able to just take Z times FY and get M sub P. You don't even have to really understand what M sub P is or how it works if you're able to tabulate Z's for people. And that's why they were developed. Same thing with S. You don't really have to understand anything about bending at all. If you know, if you want to find MY is this. You, need, you don't have to know any mechanics. And that's where why they were developed. We have to be careful. We're arriving, we're rising above this. We're understanding things on a new plane now, okay, in a new level, okay? We're understanding that these were great and useful and sometimes can be, be helpful, but sometimes they can't. Sometimes you just really have to know how it works, okay? Think about when you're cooking something. You can have a recipe, great, you can follow the recipe to the T, but let's say you're out of some spice or you're out of lemon juice or you're out of something else you have to need. Ugh, well, what do you do? Do you just stop? Well, if you uh, really understand cooking, you really understand the chemistry of cooking and flavors and palates, you can find other spices and other things that will substitute and still work. I love cooking. I love this, the chemistry of cooking at least. Anyway, my kids love the cooking channel. They watch the cooking channel all the time. But, um, but if you really understand how it works, you don't need a recipe. You can do it. You can rise above. Same thing with these. You with me? Okay. So, how do you find these items? And I say with non constant FY. Let's just say with constant FY. It's constant FY first. How do you find M sub Y? M, M sub Y. How do you find it? Well, you're going to look at your cross section, and you're going to assume that it's going to be happening in an extreme fiber, right? Because we know that no matter what your cross section looks like, that the strain diagram is going to look something like that, right? And the stress diagram is going to look, hey, it's going to look something like that, the same. Actually, it may look a little bit different um, because of, of where you're at, but it's going to be the highest at the edges, right? The highest at the edges. And MY is going to happen first at the edges. Okay? So what do you do if it's a non-constant FY? Let's say I start chopping this bad boy up and I make different FYs for different sections. Why would you do that? I have no idea. Actually, people did these things called hybrid girders where it was very, very sexy at one point to do it, but now everyone's kind of lost interest in it. Not everyone, but a lot of people have lost interest in it where they'll make something like the flanges were like, you know, 100 KSI material and the web is like 36 KSI material. And they're like, we're going to get all this strength. And they, they, got, they got improved strength, but the, what they realized is that what's just as important as strength is serviceability. So you can get all the strength in the world, but if it deflects too much, it's no good. If it's not stiff enough, it's no good. And if you remember back to buckling, strength has no impact on buckling. Zero. 
So, yeah, it did great in zone one. <laughs> it did great in areas that were short spans, but it didn't do us any good at all for longer span structures. I mean, not, I, I can't say not any good. Really didn't help people as much as they thought it would for longer span structures. But you still need to work how to learn how to solve these problems. Okay? Awesome. How do you do this if you have different FYs? Give up. Yep. Skip that one on the test. Boy, I wish I could do that in real life. You know, I don't want to have this conversation. This is a hard one. I'll just skip it. It doesn't work that way. What do you do? Well, the strain diagram. Think back to the first principles. Is the strain diagram going to look any different? No. Won't look any different. Is the stress diagram going to look any different? Mm. No. It's not. Are the limits? Well, I say no. It could. Yes, it could. It definitely could. Um, one classic way to work a problem like this is to assume the stress diagram is the same. And then check it. Say, Everywhere there is a interface, say, hey, what are the stresses here? What are the stresses here? What are the stresses here? And did I break anything? Did I break any rules? And if I did, then I might have to change the stress diagram. I might have to adjust and go backwards till I find the stress diagram that causes what? The very first amount of yielding on the cross section. Okay, so I don't I've tried to say that a couple different ways. I have to try to say, restate it again today, and I don't know if there's any other way you can learn it other than you just have to go do homework on it, okay? Or I make you do this. But if you have questions, I'd love to try to answer them, okay? Okay, so now let's do MCP. How do you find MCP for a potato with a constant FY? Constant FY at first. First point, what do you got to find? Uh, I wouldn't recommend looking for Z. I mean, I guess you, you could say that. I, um, I'd recommend looking for phi MCP. How can you find phi MCP? What do you do? There's very clear steps. Undergrad stuff. Some of the moments about what? Centroid? No. Point of equal area. That's right. What do we call that? What's the sciencey name? The plastic neutral axis. The plastic neutral axis. So we've, we've heard of a neutral axis, right? That's the centroid. That's also known as the elastic neutral axis. That's what the structure bends about when things are elastic. And when things become plastic, they don't bend about that centroid anymore. Why? Well, because when things start to yield, it loses stiffness. When it loses stiffness, it doesn't contribute to what we think the cross-sectional area is anymore. So our neutral axis actually moves. It moves as things yield. It moves from one place to another. Moves in the cross section. The plastic neutral axis, but if we have a constant FY, the point of equal area, that's right. Find that point, you plastify everything above, you plastify everything below, you assume it's all at its yield strength, basically. Some moments about that plastic neutral axis, you get M sub P, right? So how do you get Z? Well, that's easy, you divide by FY, right? Okay, what do you do we do not have a constant FY. Well, the, um, the sum of the moments is the same. Those steps the same. There's one step that's different. The step in finding the plastic neutral axis. And how is it different? 
That's right. You have to look at some of the area times the Fy, or make sure that we balance the forces in the area above and below. It's about balancing forces, not about balancing area. Now, that area calculation, well, we could have gone back, and when I taught it to you for the first time, I could have included the Fy, but it's kind of silly because they all cancel out. So why not just think about area? It's easier for people. Okay? But we can't do that anymore. When we think about things with not constant Fy, we have to take the area times Fy equal to the area times Fy. And we can say 1, this is summation of area, summation of area. And we want to find where these two points are equal. And where these two points are equal, that is our plastic neutral axis. That's our plastic neutral axis. And that is where bending occurs about right before the plastifies, right before plastic hinge forms. That's the defi definition of plastic neutral axis. And it actually moves. For non-symmetric, I mean, it's kind of silly. For a, for a eye shape, actually the plastic neutral axis, well, depending on where the FYs are, but let's just say the, um, the plastic neutral axis and the elastic neutral axis are often in the same location. For a T, they're not. They're not at all in the same location. So they'll actually move. You'll have something like the elastic, and then you'll have the plastic. And as you load it, you'll actually, your neutral axis will move with loading above yield. It'll move. Now, thank goodness that we don't have to solve for this very often. Thank goodness we don't have to derive exactly what the deflected shape is going to be of one of these plastic hinges up until the plastic hinge. Thank goodness that oftentimes we just assume that it goes up. If we look at an M versus theta type plot, that it goes up and it goes over. Because if not, you actually have to if you want to find that, you actually have to move the plastic neutral axis through the cross section, solve for the moments, back solve for the, ro for the rotation, and I, th I find that's the best way to solve the problem. I think I might ask you to do that. So you might think about that and be like, I don't understand. Okay, you'll figure it out for the homework, right? You're asking me how to do it for your homework, right? Something like that point is is that oftentimes we care about when yielding happens, when first yielding happens, and when plastification happens. We can find that point very easily. We can find this point very easily. It takes a whole lot of math to get everything in between. For design purposes, you often only need to know these two points. This class, we're going to make you find other things in between. Okay? It's good for you. It's like eating vegetables. right? Okay. Talked about that. Hey, how do you find Z for a non-equal Fy? You know, you could do something like that. You could take some average of the Fy's, divide by the M sub P. You could come up with like an approximate Z if one wanted to. But as far as the strict equation, Z doesn't apply anymore for, for a non-constant Fy. How about S? Same thing. Now, we went over this earlier, folks. We talked about this before. Okay? When, when, when these are man-made mathematical thing crutches to help, I'll just say it, the simple-minded understand how to go from Fy to an M sub P or from Fy to an M sub Y without understanding all the details that happen in between. Okay? We're not those people anymore. You have to understand what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah? Awesome. Cool. So, last time we were doing some work. We worked an example on how to find what your M sub P was and your plastic neutral axis for non-uniform FY. Finish that. It's done.
And I flip over on this back side. Let's see. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna do things a little out of any amount of order or not. Ah, we'll go in the order. Okay, so I'm going to ask this question. We, we're talking about plastic hinges, right? We're talking about plastic hinges. And I'm going to ask the question, does a member fail when it reaches its plastic moment? It depends. And that's for exactly right. It depends. A lot of people sometimes want to say, yes, I want to stop. That scares me when that happens. And if you have a, and we're going to work two example problems. We're going to work one where um, does a member fail when it reaches a plastic moment? Yes, this is failure. Failure. And this is no, we're going to live on. Okay. So let's work this example together. And I'm going to say, okay, we're going to, I'm going to present you with a technique or a process that you will be doing the math on. Maybe in, in the previous classes you've had, you've been able to talk about, oh, this is kind of what happens, and everyone he, 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 feels good about it. Now it's time to get down and dirty. Now it's time to get some bruises. Okay, it's a contact sport. And now let's talk, about, let's talk about this structure. Let's say we have a simply supported beam, and I have a load in the middle. What is my moment diagram going to look like? Who knows? Losing confidence in you. Who knows? A triangle. Yay. And it's a maximum at the middle. And what's the value? P over 4. You should be able to just roll right off your tongue. P over 4. So now let's say I take that triangle, I take that moment, and I increase it keep increasing. I keep adding load, keep adding load, keep adding load until I get a plastic hinge formation. We're, we'll throw buckling out. We'll act like buckling's not an issue. Okay? For this to work, buckling has to not be an issue. That's really important. Global buckling and local buckling. We'll talk about what that means coming up. So, no buckling. No buckling. We have to fall in that case one, that zone one. If I keep increasing my load, I can keep increasing it until I reach what? M sub P. And keep increasing it until I reach M sub P. Now, what's going to happen once I reach M sub P? Create a hinge. I'll create a hinge. A hinge will actually form in the beam. Boom! Something like that. I swear I have colors, but since it's all black and white, no one can tell. It's dumb. Anyway, so once a hinge forms, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's beautiful up here. You just can't see it. Anyway, once a hinge forms, what happens? It will actually form, form a mechanism. It becomes unstable. This is no longer a stable structure. This is unstable. Unstable. And when things are unstable, it falls and it falls. Now, <coughs> ask another question. Is that structure going to fail? Depends on what your definition of failure is. Is that structure still a beam? No. It's not a beam. Beams are flat like boards. Beams bend under, under their own load. This structure now becomes actually two tension members. That member's in tension and that member's in tension. And what you'll find in real life when you talk about real forensics at this point, it actually becomes a function of your connections. Oftentimes, the beam is plenty big. Plenty big. 
and it'll still act in tension. And now these connections at the edges are going to be loaded in way different ways than they were ever designed for. And they were designed to be loaded in shear, right? And now you're going to get a full-on tension pull on them. And when do they fail? And at what load do they fail? And that's what forensic engineers figure out. Okay. But this thing doesn't necessarily fail, but it's not a beam. It's not good. It's not something we want to have happen because what happens is our structure may drop like a foot. Okay? And you will get sued over this. And if you go into the court and you'd say, but it didn't fail. Your good luck convincing a jury of that. All right, I mean they're gonna. You know the answer is it depends, and it's not a beam anymore, and that's what it was to begin, and nobody might have died, but dang it, you didn't do what you wanted it to do. You're designing a beam, not a teeter totter or a, you know a trampoline or something like that. Okay, okay, because that's what it really comes down to. It becomes a tension member. Well, that's good to talk about. We can talk about that in this class. Other classes that might have freaked people out talk about that okay we can go there okay but that's what really happens and these members these connections now become really 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 important and if you look at things called progressive collapse which is I don't know why but some people think it's more sexy these days to think about I'm gonna, I'm gonna prevent if I have a localized failure in a structure from my entire structure from coming down and that's a good thing but oftentimes what they look at is they look at connections under really weird loading cases that's what it comes down to that's what progressive collapse does. Can the connections hold it? If there's a fire and I lose a column, do I have enough stiffness in other places to save the rest of the building? How long does a fire actually have to go before I lose multiple columns? Is there a critical column? Can I do something to that critical column to give the fire life long as long as possible? Coated in concrete, for example. Best fireproofing known to man. Okay? Okay, so now let's talk about this structure. And we're going to go through the same steps, the exact same steps. We're just going to do them, just be more of them. But if you remember in this case, we found that our, we looked at our load, we found our moment diagram, we increased our moment diagram until we got a hinge. We call that an event. Okay, and once an event happens, we change our structure and we look at our structure and see if it's stiff or not, but we're leaving out a step. A very critical step that we didn't need to do here that we're going to have to do here. I'll tell you all about that next. So now I have this structure. Fix, fix, beam. The load's offset. It's at one L over 4 from this side, 3L over 4 from this side. Okay? So what's the moment diagram going to look like? I don't expect you to know the values. What do you think it'd look like? First of all, is it going to be negative or positive here? Negative. Is it going to be more negative here or more negative here? Left or right? Which one's higher? Right. You need to know that. Load is distributed by stiffness. This span is way stiffer than this span. This moment has to be way higher than that moment. You should know that. This is negative, and this is negative, and one is more than the other. And you should know which one that is. Okay? How about here at the point load? Do you think it's going to be a maximum? Do you think it's going to be a positive or negative? Which one? Hmm. Positive. How about the values in between? Is it curved or is it straight? How'd you know? There's no load in this span. There's no loading. That means the shear diagram's got to be constant. And the integral of a constant is a linear equation. So we know this has to be straight. I mean, you should be able to draw this and know what this should look like without any numbers. And that is what you need to develop. Because when you go out and you start using computer programs to do structural analysis and things like that, you start to look at your values that come out of that computer program, and you can't tell in an instant 
whether it's ballpark being right or not, that is you become very dangerous. You've become a possible threat to humanity. You can't do that. Okay, it's great. So we're going to plug in our numbers on that happy note. On um, We're going to find that this value is actually 9P1L over 64. This value is 3P1L over 64. And this value is 9P1L over 128. And if we drew the total static moment, if we drew this, if we drew this flat area in, and we looked at the value here, it should be about PL over 4. Now, that's not going to be exact. But it should be in the ballpark of PL over 4. It's another check that you need to just, you know, be able to have a feel for. Okay? Great. Okay, so that's what our moment diagram is. Which one is largest? Which is the largest moment? Who can do math? Hmm. 9PL over 64 is actually the highest. How'd you know? Well, we have to have a 9 and a 9 here. This has a smaller denominator. Smaller denominators have higher values, right? This one's the largest. So what does that mean? Not maybe, will. Will. If we imagine increasing all of these simultaneously, all of them, all of them, all of them, until we hit a limit, the very first one that's going to hit M sub P, if M sub P is constant here, in positive moment and negative moment, and for steel it often is. For reinforced concrete it's not. Depends on how much steel you have in it, reinforcing steel you have in it, right? Where they're actually located. So if you take me for advanced steel, or advanced concrete, we do these calculations. Positive M sub P is not the same thing as negative M sub P. So you actually have to compare them. Okay. But in steel, it's pretty common, at least with rolled sections, that things are going to be symmetric. Okay, so you're going to find out, ow, oh, 9P1. I'm going to say, and, and what's going to happen? The hinge is going to form. And what do we call that? An event. It's like a party, right? Yeah. Not always. You can have scary events too, right? Like deaths. That's a that's a scary event. First event. First event's gonna happen when nine over sixty four P one L is equal to M sub P. I'm just gonna write in pencil. M sub P. 9 over 64. P1L. Now, why did I know this happened first? How did I know this is my first event? Because it's the highest moment. What if I don't have a constant positive moment and negative moment? Well, I compare every one of them, right? And I figure out which one requires the lowest amount of load. Because that's going to happen first. Agree. Okay. So now I'm going to solve. I'm going to solve and get P1. Okay, so that's the load that's needed for event 1 to occur. Is my structure dead? No. No, it's not. How come? Yeah, now I have one member that's overloaded, isn't it? One part of my member that's overloaded, but not the rest of it. And that's called structural resiliency, right? Right? So that's a hinge. This is my new structure now. I draw the new structure. This is structure after the hinge formation. And we just said it wasn't dead. Did it change? Of course it changed. <clears throat> so what's the moment going to look like? Okay, we should be able to do this together. What's the moment going to look like here? 
Negative or positive? Negative. What's the moment going to look like here? Negative or positive? Good answer. <laughs> Zero. What's the moment going to look like here? Positive. There's no reason for it to flip. Positive. Okay. 15 P2L over 512. 3 P2L over 32. This, this value uh, goes here. Okay, that's cool. We got a new structure. We've put our load on it. And notice I've called it P2. Why did I call it P2? Because we're trying to find out how much additional load we can place on this structure until we get another event to occur. P1 is how much load it took to for the first event. P2 is going to be how much load it's going to take for the second event. Okay. Okay, so where do you think the second event's going to occur at? And if anyone's trying to guess, you're wasting your time. Instead, you just need to do the math. Don't even think, don't even guess. Do the math. Where could it occur at? Where do you think it's most likely where it, where it could occur? There's two places. Where do you think they are? The load and underneath uh, and, and at the support. It's going to be one of the two. So let's check them. Let's check them both, right? Let's check them both. So let's first, we'll do Miles' favorite. Second event. We'll check the hinge at the left wall. So, if I take 3P1L over 64, what? Where's that coming from? 3P1L over 64, where's that from? That's from our first moment. Why is that important? Because that is already on there. P1 didn't go away. P1 is still there. P1 is what caused this hinge to form. In causing this hinge, P1 also caused a negative moment over here. And the value was 3P1L over 64. So that's already there. Then I have to add to it what? 3P2L over 32. set that equal to MCP. Okay. So I'll check that. So I'll know, I already know what P1 is. I know what L is. I know what L is. I know what MCP is. I'll be able to solve for P2. Am I done? No, I have to check the other one, don't I? Underneath the point load. Right? Okay. So now let's look at hinge at point load. How do I do that? Nine P one L over one twenty eight. It's a good place to start. You need to understand why we're doing this. Don't be robots. Think about what's going on. I have to take this positive moment that was created by P1. It was already there. I have to take that into account. It's the number one mistake people make when they do this. And I have to add to it 15 P2 L over 512. Well, what do I set that equal to? M to P. 
and I solve. And I figure out which is the lowest P2. Which one's going to be the lowest P2? Okay? But I can tell you it's going to be this one. For reasonable re L's, reasonable M's to P's, it's going to be that one. So what's that mean? It's where the next hinge is going to form. Are we dead? Well, let's draw a picture. Now we have a hinge here. Now we have a hinge here. Are we dead? Now it's going to start acting like a simple supported beam. So the moment diagram should be really easy, right? What's it going to be here? Zero. Good answer. What's it going to be here? Zero. It's going to be a maximum at the point load. Bell of Doom is coming in a second. Three P three L over sixteen is the moment. Where do you think the hinge is going to form next? At the point at where the point load is. There's not a lot of guessing here. Third event. So I'm going to take 9P1L over 128 plus, whoa, which moment do I have, do I take, I take 9P1L over 128, 15P2L over 512, right? Plus 3P3L over 16. And I'm going to set that equal to M sub P. Now, at this point, I have everything except for P3. And I solve for P3. So what load is it going to take for it to fail? What's that? That's right. The failure load is going to be equal to P1 plus P2, plus P3. And if one wanted to, one could actually calculate the deflection caused by P1. You'd put P1 on this structure. The deflection, the additional deflection caused by P2, you'd put P2 on this structure on the deflection, and the deflection caused by P3, you put that on that structure, and you'd add them up together, and you'll get something that looks like, this will be like load, or P, or something like that, you'll have like, it'll be very stiff, and then it'll be less stiff, and then it'll be less stiff, and then it'll just go forever, event, event, event. Why does the stiffness change? Well, how do I know the stiffness is changing? Well, the slope is changing. And slope is equal to stiffness. So it goes from high stiffness, lower stiffness, lower stiffness. What? What's going on? When the hinges form, you're changing the stiffness of your system. You're going from more of a fixed, fixed type structure to eventually a pin, pin type structure. How many hinges do you need? Depends. Depends on the structure. You may need five. You may need six. You may need ten. You may need one. You may need three. You may need two. You keep going until you find the hinges. You keep going until you find the mechanism. It gets really hard when you get like huge frames. Okay? Because you may find that you're loading all, all this loading stuff and loading stuff and all of a sudden all you need is that beam to fail and then that's it. 
it's over. It may be that it's a critical number of things together that have to work together to fail. Weird bunch of hinges together that cause it to fail. So it's hard to find out. You actually need to, and this is called an event to event analysis. And we're going to be working problems like this. And for this to work, what has to be true? No buckling. No global buckling, no local buckling. Why? Because we're relying on these hinges to do a lot of rotation. We're relying on a lot of rotation out of these hinges, a lot of movement. And if they buckle, that doesn't work. We can't, we can't get any more out of them. If they buckle, it's almost like they're not there anymore. There's no way to really transfer load there anymore. They can't hold any more load. These don't hold any more load, but they're able to keep moving. They're able to keep deflecting. When this, when this thing hits a hinge, it's as if the moment verse rotation goes like this. So not only does it have to be no buckling, but we have to have ductility. We've got to be able to get large rotations. And in steel, that's not a problem. Okay? Not a problem in steel. Concrete sometimes can be an issue. Steel is not usually a problem. But again, oftentimes it'll come down to your connection. How ductile is your connection? What kind of rotation? And do we know how to do that? Do we know how to see what kind of rotation that connection can go through? That was a homework problem, right? That's due on the 12th, right? Okay. That's it.